the final phase of the exploration project was left largely to the erudition of Lorenzo the Magnificent and the skill of Leonardo da Vinci. Lorenzo de' Medici was a distinguished Platonist, a patron of secret societies, the founder of an important philosophical school, and a subtle adversary of the Borgias. Leonardo was a faithful agent of the great Florentine prince, and one of those men possessed by the spirit of towardness. Although Lorenzo did not live to see the fulfillment of the great plan, quote unquote, he spoke the magic word which opened for Columbus the most exclusive institutions in Europe and invested him with the temporal means for acquiring a measure of consideration from liberal princes and scholars. You see, it was the invisible hand of the Medici that balanced on end the celebrated egg. The conclusions of Columbus concerning the shape of the earth indicate that he was acquainted with the esoteric traditions of Asia and the Near East. He partly revealed the source of his own instructions when he declared the planet to be shaped like a pear, the upper end of which projected toward the sky like the boss in the center of a shield, and it was not until we put satellites in the sky that the modern man discovered that the earth is shaped like a pear. And this discovery, ladies and gentlemen, came only recently only recently. So we know that Columbus did have some source of esoteric truth that was not known by the common man and was way beyond the ability of those at that time to even perceive or to know unless they were the remnant of some great society that had gone before and was destroyed. Now, I'm not telling you that that's the truth, for no one really knows, but that's what all of the evidence seems to point to. And who are these people, the survivors? Well, I would not even want to venture a guest at this point, but I certainly want to continue my research, and I want you to continue yours, and together we will find out. Now, what he knew about the earth is that the top of this protuberance of the pear-shaped earth was the terrestrial paradise where none could go except by the grace of God. The admiral noted that this shape coincided with the opinions of certain holy and wise theologians, but he failed to mention the sects or religions to which they belonged. The earth mountain was certainly the Meru of the Brahmins and the sacred hill of the Egyptian mysteries. Mount Meru, like Chang Shambhala, Olympus, and the peak described in the Revelation are all veiled allusions to the invisible government of the earth. In case you didn't hear that, I'm going to repeat it. The earth mountain was certainly the Meru of the Brahmins and the sacred hill of the Egyptian mysteries. Mount Meru, like Chang Shambhala, Olympus, and the peak described in the Revelation are all veiled allusions to the invisible government of the earth. Nor should it be assumed, ladies and gentlemen, that all historical uncertainty centered around Columbus. Cologne, the dove of Genoa. The case of John Cabot is equally curious. There may be more than passing interest in the observation of one research student who said, quote, When Columbus in the interim between voyages disappears from public view, John Cabot appears and permanently disappears when Columbus reappears, unquote. See the book entitled New Truths About Columbus by Grace A. Findler for reference to that. You see, it's easy to forget that John Cabot was really Giovanni Caboto, born in Genoa and a naturalized citizen of Venice. It was especially mentioned that in one of his journeys, Cabot visited Mecca, and like Columbus, was acquainted with the wise men of the Near East. It has even been suggested that he had contacted the religious and political convictions of the secret Christian sect of the Johannites, which played so large a part in the esoteric doctrines of the Templars. K. 
Cabot conveniently found the ear of the English king and was immediately entrusted with a delicate diplomatic mission to Denmark to arbitrate disputes over the fisheries of Iceland. Grace Findler also notes that the records of the English privy purse shows a pension paid to one Antonio Cabot for several years after John Cabot was historically dead. The pension passed through the hands of an English merchant named Ricci di Americhi. The voyages of Cabot were important inasmuch as they resulted in a division which gave most of North America to the English group which was free from the theological and mercenary pressures of the Spanish program. You see, the great plan reached the Western Hemisphere through a series of incidents. Many early explorers and colonizers are known to have been associated with secret societies. There is no historical way of determining the secret spiritual convictions of so-called conquistadores, adventurers and founders of plantations. It is a well-established fact, folks, that arts, sciences, philosophies, and political convictions accompany less valuable merchandise along trade routes and caravan trails. Some of the colonizers were probably unaware of the parts they were playing, and the settlements which they founded remained for generations without the strength or security to advance ideological programs. The work then, as always, was in the hands and keeping of a very few initiated leaders. They were responsible for the results, and they built slowly and wisely, thinking not of their own days or of their own reputation, but of the future in which the, quote, great plan, unquote, would be fulfilled. You all, all of you out there listening all around the world, have such unlimited potential. If only your own personal handsome prince or princess could deliver to your lips that magic kiss that would wake you from your profound sleep. Good night, and God bless you all.